right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Midweek Connect. I hope your week has been great so far. And uh, if it hasn't, then I hope it gets better from, from here. Uh, I'm so grateful that you're in the house tonight. We have our youth in the sanctuary this evening, so we're grateful for our youth. John and Cassie Shadon leading our youth, grateful that they are in here. Normally, they're meeting back in their youth room. And they have great discussions and lessons that they go over, so grateful we can spend some time with them. We have a very special guest with us this evening. Well, I guess two guests, the Krilly uh, family. We got Hayden and Seth Curley. We're grateful that y'all are here all the way from Ohio. Uh, I love it because when, whenever they get to spend time with the Fosters, uh, we get to hang out with them too. So it's like, uh, you know, everybody gets to share in on the love. So <laughs> grateful for it. And I'm thankful that you're here this evening. Uh, a couple announcements that I want to make mention of before we, we begin. And the first is that this weekend we have our men's work day this Saturday. So 9 o'clock, all of our men, make sure you show up. Uh, we intend to keep it a nice short window. You know, sometimes you show up to a church work day and you're like, this work day never ends. So we're hoping it'll be a work morning, basically, and be, be done by, that, uh, by noon or somewhere in that time frame. So Leroy, thank you so much for leading our men's ministry for all that you do. Uh, Pastor mentioned this back on Sunday, all the improvements that have been happening to the property recently, and we're grateful to our men's ministry uh, for working hard and uh, making sure that happens. So remember that men's work day on the 20th this Saturday. Uh, the second announcement that I wanted to make is that this upcoming Sunday at 9.15 and 11.15, we have our Spanish bilingual services. Very excited about that. Our Everything from worship uh, to preaching will be both in Spanish and in English. We have a great uh, Spanish translation team here at Cypress Grove Fellowship. So every Sunday in the background, you may not know about this, but uh, they translate our services uh, from English into Spanish. They have like these little headsets. So if you ever see somebody with a headset on, they're not listening to music, they're listening to translation and uh, they get to hear the words. So I'm grateful that we get to uh, share the whole experience together that we get in both Spanish and English. And uh, it's gonna be a fun, exciting service. So we're really looking forward to it. Uh, I wonder if you would, before we bring our speak to the floor, would you help me in prayer tonight? Kind of get our minds focused and our attention ready uh, to hear the word of the Lord. And uh, let's all do that together this evening. Would you close your eyes? Would you begin to speak to the Lord Jesus? I thank you, God, for this moment together, Lord, this Wednesday evening that you touch our minds and our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. We just get to spend some time with you and with your people. I pray that you speak through, uh, speak through your word, God, to us, that we would hear it, we would receive it, and help us to apply it to our lives, Lord. We're so grateful for your grace in our lives, for the power of the Holy Spirit, and we thank you for meeting us in this place. Lord, speak your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. All right, I wonder if you would, would you welcome our speaker to the floor this evening, Brother Seth Crilly? Would you make him feel welcome? <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. It is. It's good to be with y'all tonight. Um, I'm loving this casual Wednesday service. This is great. Uh, takes the pressure off a little bit. So, well, my wife Hayden and I are so glad to be in the sunny state of Florida. Uh, we have endured weeks of rain in Ohio. We had just about a waterfall rushing down our driveway this past week. So it is. It's good to be with. The in-laws, the best in-laws in the world, the Foster family. I tell, I tell Hayden I would have married her anyway, but she has a great family too. So God's been good. Um, I'd like to give honor to, to pastors, Barrick. <laughs> uh, we love you all so much. You've been so kind, kind to me and, and my wife, and just thank you for having us tonight. Um, and honor to my pastor at home, Pastor Nick Strange. Uh, I love him, and I don't know where I would be without him, so give honor to him. Well, we'll jump in tonight. Uh, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. We're going to do a little bit of teaching tonight, and we're going to teach on giving. I got a little bit tight there. <laughs> No, we're going we're gonna to have a good time, and I don't know of any special offering, so you're in the clear. <laughs> but we're going to be talking about giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. You know, giving is, is a form of worship. 
uh, that we give, not just in our finances, there's a lot of ways we can give in our time, in our effort, in the things that we do. Um, and it is a, a form of worship to God, and He honors that worship. And so we are going to, to talk about that tonight. Um, if I had to title it, I would say uh, self, Selfish or Selfless, or Selfish or Selfless. We're going to be talking about the story of Jesus calling Peter and Andrew and how he said you're going to be fishers of men. So would you rather sell fish or would you rather self less in giving to God? So that is our topic tonight. Um, for, for the youth in hyphen, Pastor Barrick asked me to tailor this lesson for you, and it, it will hit all age groups, but uh, for youth in hyphen, I'm going to try to save you some time tonight in life. There are lessons we learn the hard way uh, by trying things on our own, and there's some lessons we have to learn that way, but there are other lessons we can learn from the wisdom of others. There's lessons we can learn from people that have done it the hard way. And so we don't have to make the same mistakes that they make. And I would definitely suggest learning things that way. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to have to make your own mistakes if you can learn from someone else. And so I am, I'm going to share uh, what I have learned from others and for myself about giving to God tonight. Uh, I certainly have not perfected this. Um, but I'd like to think that I'm, I'm doing better uh, learning from others and not making my own mistakes. I still make a few. I still make a few here and there. But I'd like to think I'm, I'm doing better. So please tonight learn this lesson now because it will be a blessing to you. Um, let's talk about society today for a little bit. It's going to be a little discouraging off the gate, okay? But we're going we're gonna to get somewhere. Society today, we live in a self-centered, consumer-driven, driven commercialism society. A new phone is released every single year, and if you don't have the newest, the greatest, the latest cell phone, you are in the Stone Ages. <laughs> every phone is made obsolete in six months to a year, and if you don't have it, your, your popularity is gone those few, you know, pixels on your camera are making all the difference in your world. Social media, how many followers can I get? How many likes? Who's commented on my post? Is my picture perfect? It's filled with filters and effects. You're trying to create this social, social image to get people to like you. And I'm not saying these things are evil, uh, but they can definitely be abused. And they can easily become self-centered and not about connecting with others, but how can I gain in my own self-image? Ads and influencers persuading us to buy what they are selling, to look how they look and to act how they act. Billboards in the highway saying, get the luxury car or watch, or so-and-so got me $1.5 million for my car in accident. Injury. I've seen a lot of those in Florida. You guys got a lot of lawyers around here. <laughs> what can I get out of life is the common attitude, the prevailing attitude. Yet we live in the most, li in most likely the most depressed, unhappy society our world has ever seen. Depression, anxiety, suicide rates continue to climb. Divorce, all of these things mark that there is something deeply wrong with this mindset and attitude of self-centeredness. I've started this habit of, of asking people uh, close to me, it, it, you know, I asked my grandfather and Bishop Strange, who was the, the former pastor of our church, uh, both have passed away, but before they did, I asked them, the question, what is the best life advice you can give me? Because I valued their wisdom. My grandfather, I called him Pop. Pop said, 
you know, if I lost everything, and, and if you understand my grandparents on my dad's side, they're, they're uh, collectors. <laughs> they have a lot of things. If you ask my granny for anything, it, it seems like she can pull anything from the attic or the basement, anything you need. And so collectors, uh, to put politely, um, but Pop said, you know, if my house burnt down and I lost everything that I had, but I still had my family and my friends and my relationship with God. That's all I really need. And when I asked Bishop Strange, he said, you know, the two most important words in the kingdom of God is I will. I will go. I will give. I will sacrifice. And so giving is, is a mindset and it is a lifestyle that will bring you a lot of happiness and a lot of satisfaction. Not giving to feel good about yourself or to get a tax deduction, <laughs> but out of the goodness of your heart, as our scripture said, not grudgingly or of necessity, but because you love God, because you love investing. Sometimes you feel like Charlie Brown in the Christmas special. And trying to find the true meaning of Christmas, it seems it has all turned to Commercialism. <laughs> Even my dog has gone commercial, says Charlie Brown. All Charlie Brown sees is the buying and the marketing and the wish lists and the tin trees. But he's determined, he says, I won't let all this commercialism ruin my Christmas. That's my attempt. I don't want commercialism. I don't want self-centeredness to ruin our lives. But I want giving to be our mindset. I want that to be our lifestyle because I've found in my own life that's where true satisfaction comes. If I can give to the kingdom of God, if I can invest my life into his will and purpose, that's the greatest satisfaction you'll ever find in life. And so our lesson tonight is to be like Charlie Brown. Not give into this self-absorbed, selfish culture, but to be a giver. Why should we give? Why, why should we give to a cause, to the kingdom of God, to move the mission? I have to say that because I'm a sectional youth leader in Ohio. We just had a rally. So give to move the mission. It will make your sectional leader very happy. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We give because we are thankful for all that God has done in our lives. Paul said it's only reasonable that we give our lives to God for all that he's done. It's only reasonable that we come to God and say, whatever you can do through me, however I can give to your kingdom, I am willing. Because when we come to pray to God or to ask of him something that we have need of, we're coming to a God who endured unimaginable torture, who paid for our sins on a bloody cross, made available his salvation, filled us with his spirit so that we might have power over the sin that bound us and loves us more than anyone ever could. We come to a God that paid the ultimate price for us. So how could we do any less than say, Lord, whatever I can give to your kingdom, it's only reasonable. <laughs> it only makes sense that we could love God enough to say, I'm going to give back to you because no one else deserves it more. Why would we not want to? <laughs> we look at this God that is so great, that has done so many good things in my life. I can go back to notebooks and testimonies of things and mark where it was, it, there was no, no reason, no explanation, but only God could do that. Only God could transform my life in that way. How could I not give back to your kingdom? And so I have to remind myself in those moments that maybe when he asked me to give something crazy, or at least in my mind something crazy, I think, you know what, God? You're deserving of it, no matter what you're asking me to do. He says, not out of duty, but of love. We don't give God to earn our way, give to God to earn our way into heaven. We're not paying off God 
to say, all right, I'm going to give you this much so that I can get into the pearly gates. We do it because we love him. Again, not grudgingly, not of necessity, but because I love God. We, um, when I was in elementary school during Christmas time, they had this, this uh, store set up. They called it Santa's Workshop. And let me tell you, it was a racket. Okay. <laughs> they, would, they would set up this shop with all these cheap gifts, plastic, you know, faux leather wallets and, and all this stuff. And they'd say, okay, you're going to buy, you're going to be, a, it's going to be available to buy your parents Christmas gifts and your family Christmas gifts. And if you didn't show up with money to buy something, you felt so guilty. Because you're looking at all your classmates buying gifts for their parents and you think, I haven't brought anything. And so it was this guilt racket that these people set up to, to force kids to use their parents' money. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> My parents gave me money to buy them Christmas presents. And so I go in, and for years, I, they always had these Christmas pins, plastic, but they looked like jewels, that caught my eye, and I thought, my mom would love those. I had no reason to think my mom would love them, uh, but I thought my mom would love these. And so for like six years in a row, I bought her these ugly Christmas pins, <laughs> And every Christmas morning, she would open those up and say, oh, how beautiful. And she'd put those pins on, and she'd wear them every Christmas. A couple of years ago, she got all those pins out and wore them all over her sweater <laughs> at Christmas time. And I imagine that's what giving to God's kingdom is like. Because here's this God that owns everything. He is over all the universe, heaven in his thro is his throne and, and earth is his footstool. Yet Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. In Deuteronomy 10, 14, Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God's and the earth also with all that therein is. He owns it all. It all belongs to him. A thousand rivers of oil, cattle on a thousand hills. Yes. And we give back to him when he asks. Not because he really needs it, because he doesn't, but because we love him. Because we love him. Just like we buy those Christmas presents for our parents when we're using their money. <laughs> but because we love them. I got this for you. I'm giving this to you, Jesus. Really belongs to him anyway. Our tithe is really giving God back a portion of what is his already. <laughs> he blesses us with all of it, and he just asks for a small portion back. I was at uh, the Pentecostals of Alexandria one time. Sister Vesta Mangan was taking up offering, and she said, the ushers are now going to come and relieve you of the Lord's money. <laughs> That's really what they're doing. <laughs> It's the Lord's anyway. We give because we love him. Not because he needs it, but because we love him. Nexus chapter 35 and 36 gives an account of God commanding the Israelites to build him a tabernacle or a meeting place, a place for his presence to come and dwell, a place for them to come and relate to God, to offer sacrifice. And so Moses has this conversation with God, and God gives him the instructions for this tent, this meeting place, this tabernacle. And he says, take up an offering to build and to pay for this tabernacle. And so Moses tells the people of God, we're going to build this tent for God. And he's asked that we take up an offering for it. In chapter 35, beginning at verse 21, it says, And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering. So Moses tells them, you know, we're going to make a house for God. We're going to make a meeting place where we can sacrifice for our sin and where we can offer up sacrifices to him. And the people, it says their heart, and the ones that their heart was stirred and their spirit was made willing, 
know what happened is they've been wandering in the wilderness for a while. And they look back to Egypt and they thought, God brought us out of slavery. He took us across the Red Sea. He led us as a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. We've never hungered. (laughs) He's always provided water. Our clothes don't wear out. He's given us everything we ever needed, and we've been made free. How could we not give back to Him? How could I not give an offering to make a meeting place for God? A little while later, verse 5 of chapter 36, And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. When they looked at what all God had done for them, they just kept giving and giving and giving until they're looking around saying, we've got so much more than we could ever use for this tabernacle. And still the people kept giving. They looked at the gold and and the silver and all the jewels and all the fabrics and they say, we didn't buy this. We didn't work for this. We walked out of Egypt and they handed it to us because of our God. Our God gave us everything that is in our hands. How could we not give it back to him? And every time there's an offering or a missionary comes by, I think about that. Everything that I have belongs to him. Everything in my life he has given me, he has blessed me with. How could I not give back to his kingdom? How could I not give back to furthering his gospel? He is so deserving of it. That's the attitude of a giver. My mom always, one of her famous sayings is there's there's two people in this world. There's givers and takers. I want to be a giver. I want to be a giver. Again, that scripture we read, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Anyone that looks in his heart and says, look what God has done for me. I want to give to God. I want to bless the kingdom of God in any way that I can. Not only that, but God blesses the giver. He blesses the people that give. You think, okay, he's he's this God that's over everything. He could require payment if he wanted to, but he doesn't. He says, if you would like to give. He he could require payment for salvation, but he offers it to us freely. He blesses us, but on top of that, he says, if you give, I will bless you even greater than I have. That sounds pretty good to me. It says in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. That is amazing. He says, the more you give, the greater you'll be blessed. The greater that you measure, it will be greater measured to you. And this isn't just talking about finances. I kind of start with that, but that can be time. That can be your effort. That can be your worship. The greater that you give to God, the greater you're blessed. That's why givers always seem to be happy. (laughs) That's why givers always seem to be satisfied out of life. Because God is just blessing them. Not always, you know, with reciprocal finances. But they just, they always have what they need. God always just makes a way for it to happen. It's the kind of God he is. There is nothing I have ever regretted giving to God. There's never been a moment when God said, will you give this to me? And I did, and I thought, man, I really wish I still had that. (laughs) I really wish I wouldn't have made that pledge in the offering. I really wish I wouldn't have given that check. There's never been a moment, but every time God blesses me. I'm going to use a personal story. And 
I, I want to start out by saying I, I'm not, this is not to show how great of a giver I am because I had a bad attitude through some of this story. <laughs> uh, a couple years ago, I worked at a bank. After I graduated college, I applied to this bank, started as a teller, and in a year and a half, God bless me, I moved up to a branch manager of a bank. And it was a good career. Uh, I, was, I was making good money, had a good, secure future in this bank. And uh, I, I knew I was called to ministry. I was actively working at the church. Um, and, and, and I knew that at some point in my life, I'd be in full-time ministry. I just didn't think it would be fairly soon. And so I'm at this bank for a year and a half. I, I, the, the bank president comes to my office at our branch, and he says, we're building a brand new branch, and it's your baby. And I'm 22, 23, and I'm thinking, wow, this is great opportunity. I have a secure job. I've got everything I need for a secure future. And just a few weeks later, we're at a minister's meeting, and I'm sitting there not paying attention to anything that's being said <laughs> because God's speaking to me, and he says, I want you to quit your job. And I said, Lord, <laughs> you heard what the president said. <laughs> and I said, I don't know if I can do that. And he's dealing with it with me for a week every day. I want you to quit your job. And uh, I was, I was talking to God about it, and we had an evangelist come on a Wednesday night. Once you know it, he talked about giving. <laughs> and he took up an offering at the end. And he had this big blue sheet that we were holding at Four Corners, and people were coming in and dropping money and checks and watches and the whole deal, right? And God says, I want you to give your business card. <laughs> and so I put it in. And I went home and I told my parents, I'm quitting my job. What? <laughs> you can't quit your job. They said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to intern at the church for free. <laughs> and I did not have a good attitude. Um, again, I'm not saying this because I gave, I didn't. Listen, anything you give to God is not a sacrifice. Because it belongs to him anyway. Sometimes we act like we're really sacrificing. It belongs to him anyway. And so I quit my job, and I didn't work any. I worked at the church. I was at the church every day doing whatever needed done. And about six months in, I said, God, I'm running out of money. <laughs> and so I started working at UPS on the preload, getting up at 4 in the morning, loading trucks for a year and a half. And I'll tell you, it was the worst job I've ever been at. <laughs> And there were days I had a bad attitude. I said, God, you told me to quit my job, but I'm trusting you. Well, you see, at the bank, I had two weeks vacation. And I didn't get to work church camp because I would use those two weeks for, for general conference and a family vacation. And so I wasn't able to work church camp when I was at the bank. Well, I'm at UPS. They let me off for church camp. And that is where I met my wife. So I wouldn't be here today unless I gave God that job. Not only that, but this year, well, this past year, the church took me on full time. Now, again, this is not anything, I, I don't claim any of this. This is not to say, oh, Seth, what a wonderful giver. I'm trying to show you that anything God asks you to give He's got a plan, and he's got a blessing for your life. He knows what he's doing. And he's saying, if you'll be a giver, I can bless you. If you'll be a giver, I can do great things in your life. So why does he ask us to give beyond just blessing us? Why? He doesn't need the finances. He doesn't need the effort. Really, he could do it all on his own if he wanted to. Why did he call 12 disciples? Why did he involve humanity? God wants to involve his creation in the building of his kingdom. We read in scripture 
the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, which we think it's probably more around 10 to 12, counting the women and children. He's teaching. He's doing miracles. He's in the wilderness for a few days. And he looks at the crowd and says, they've got to be getting hungry by now. <laughs> and so he tells his disciples, why don't you go and gather up all the food that we have and we'll disperse it evenly so that everyone has something to eat. Now you're telling me out of 12,000 people, 10 to 12,000, no one had food. There were some people hiding some picnic baskets. <laughs> okay, There were some people putting blankets and coats over some lunch pails. But here comes Andrew. He's got the hand of this little boy. And he says, Jesus, you know, there's no food out here, but there's this one little guy who says he'll give you his lunch. And, you know, Andrew's probably thinking, I, he's just humoring the boy, right? It's like, we can't really do anything with this, but I'll take you to Jesus anyway. <laughs> and so here's the boy, proud. You know, he's probably wearing suspenders, right? And he's <laughs> proud as can be, carrying his lunch pail. And he comes up to Jesus, and here you go. I can picture Jesus with a big smile on his face saying, it's enough. That'll do. So he, he prays over the meal. He blesses the food. And there he begins to break those five loaves and those two, the Bible says little fish. They weren't even big whoppers. <laughs> Just little fish. Breaks them and starts passing them out in baskets. The disciples are, you know, taking the baskets, and they start handing out, and they say, I, there's just a little bit left. Here you go. And maybe they're doing it sparingly at first, right? Ah, there's not much in there. I can only give you a little bit. Here's a, here's a little morsel. Oh, there's a little bit more. <laughs> oh, what? There's a little more. And pretty soon, everyone in the crowd is fed from that small lunch. Now, God didn't, he didn't even need those two fish and those five loaves. But he said, I want to involve someone in the miraculous. I want to involve someone in what I'm going to do here. He loves doing that. He loves looking at his people and saying, come on, I want, I want to build this kingdom with you. I want to do what I'm going to do with you. I want to reach this community with you. I want, want your help. Because he wants to do it with the body of Christ. He wants to do it with his people. He loves it. He loves doing the miraculous. He loves showing what he can do with us. Amen. He wants us to share in his creation. Hallelujah. You know, God, we know this about him, that he's creative. He, he loves to create things. Spoke the world into existence. He loves building. He was a carpenter. He loves making things, and he wants to involve us in that. That's why Satan is the exact opposite. He tries to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He wants to break things down. He wants to destroy lives. And that's where self-centeredness comes in. He knows if I can make them selfish... If I, if I can make them self-interested and self-centered, if I can keep them from giving to God, I can keep them from their blessing. If I can keep them from investing in the kingdom, I can stop God's creation. I can stop what God wants to do. If I can keep CGF from giving to the kingdom of God, I can stop that kingdom from growing in Orlando. That is why giving is so much more important than just keeping the lights on. It's why it's so much more important because God is involving us in building his kingdom. He says, I want to do this with you, and I'm going to bless the body of Christ. I'm going to bless your families. Not only am I going to grow the kingdom, but I'm going to give you peace and love and joy because he blesses the giver. He wants us to share in his creation. God wants us to give him what he asks for so that he can make something so much better, so much more beautiful and miraculous. 
Because anything you give to God, cast your bread on the waters, and after many days you'll find it. He's going to give it to you so much better than it was before. That's why he put the names of his disciples on the foundation stones of heaven. As he says, look, we did this together. We won these people together because of what you have done and what you wrote in Scripture, what you did, partnering with me. He wants to involve us. And he does that by asking us to give. Now we come to the story of our title. Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee. He sees two men fishing in a boat, Peter and Andrew. They're businessmen. That's how they make a living. He walks by and he just says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, I like fishing. Paul Paul Pete likes fishing. Peter and Andrew liked fishing. It was fun, probably. It's what they enjoyed doing. But somehow to them, fishing for men sounded a whole lot better. Somehow to them, they said, you know, I like this career. I like casting the nets. But somehow I know if I give up this occupation, somehow I know if I give up selling fish, he's going to make something beautiful of my life. Somehow I know if I give up what's so important to me, everything's going to be okay. Sometimes God asks us for big things, things that aren't always easy, things that we have trouble comprehending. But if we will, like every one of those disciples, say, God, I, I put it in your hands. I trust you with it. I know it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. <laughs> he always blesses the giver. Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. He said, you know how you're, going to, how you're going to find success in life, how you're going to feel satisfied, how you're going to keep your head on straight? You'll be blessed by giving. You will be blessed by giving. So first of all, young people, learn this lesson. Give God your time. You have so much time. You might think high school is busy and you've got a lot going on. I thought the same thing when I was in school. You have so much time to give to God. You have so much time you can study His Word and get to know Him in prayer. You have so much time to get involved in, in a youth group. And, and you have so much time to go on missions trips and to go to church camps and to invest in your relationship with God. You might, you're, you definitely don't have the finances right now. And if you're in college, you definitely don't have the finances right now. But you have the time and the effort to give to God. Please learn this lesson now because it will serve you for the rest of of your life. You'll find happiness and satisfaction in your relationship with God when you become a giver. Because there's more, again, there's more to giving than just an offering, than just your finances. Give God your youth. Don't make your youth a time to learn from your own mistakes, but give God your youth. I've had so many friends that left the church, left youth group, and came back and I, I see what they could have been if they gave God their youth. And then I see other friends that stuck with it, that stayed faithful to God. And God has done amazing things in their life because they decided a long time ago, God, I'm going to give you what I have. If it's just my youth, if it's just my time, I give it to you. And I've seen God bless that. We have students in our church that are doing P7 Bible studies in their middle school. And God is blessing it. You know, the majority of our guests are from that P7 Bible study because those students are giving God their youth. They might not have the money, but they're saying, God, I'm giving you what I have. Give God your time. 
Give God your effort. If you, again, doesn't have to be finances. Give God what you have. God, I'm, anything that you need for your kingdom, I'm going to be there. If it's mowing grass, if it's scrubbing toilets, God, I just want to be a giver in your kingdom. And it doesn't matter what that looks like or what that is. God, I give it to you. I promise you he will bless it. I promise you he'll use those efforts. We return to our first scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. You know, the giver determines in his heart, I'm not doing this to get something back. I'm not doing this because I want to get something from God. He looks in his heart and says, God, I love you. And I love your kingdom. And I know really you could do this without me. <laughs> but I want to give. I want to help any way that I can. Not grudgingly or of necessity. I'm not giving because someone called up an offering and I don't want to be the only one seen not walking up with my cash. <laughs> I don't want to give because I feel guilty about it or because my parents said I should give. I want to give to the kingdom because I love the kingdom. I want to give to God because I love my God. I want to give because he wants to get me involved with him. So look for ways to give. Look for areas to give. One of the most giving families I know is the foster family. <laughs> I'm not trying to embarrass them, but the first week I was here, we were over at Nana's house, and Richard was just working and working and sweating he was getting Nana's house ready for that 4th of July party. And I thought, here is a man that's happy. <laughs> he, I, I thought to myself, he's got it made because he knows how to be a giver. Same with Heather. She gives to the kingdom of God. She puts in more hours. <laughs> Learn to be a giver. And I know there's there's... So many more families, I'm sure, that are givers. These are just my in-laws, and I love them. And I've had a good example. Look for ways to give. Don't wait until pastor says, hey, I need something. <laughs> Do it before he asks. Do it before the need comes up. Look for ways to serve. Look for opportunities. And I promise you, you will be blessed beyond measure. You'll find that in every trial and every trying time, God will always show up. Every time I'm given beyond what I thought I could give, God has always shown up. Every time I thought I was sacrificing, God says, you can't outgive me. <laughs> and he blesses me beyond measure. And so do you want a selfish or selfless? <laughs> I want a selfless. I want to be a selfless giver to God. Amen. Amen. Pastor Trevor, would you like to close us out tonight? Amen. I wonder if we could all stand this evening and uh, close in prayer. I feel so strongly that Cypress Grove Fellowship has received the word tonight that uh, you want to be a giver. And I'd love the examples of the fosters that they're the first family that I think of when I think about giving. <laughs> uh, but you're right, Seth. There's so many folks here at Cypress Grove Fellowship that have a giving heart. And I'm grateful for it. I'm so thankful that uh, we have a generous church, that we're not about hoarding and keeping the resource to ourselves, our time, our energy, our finances, what God has given us. We're so blessed, church. 
We're so blessed. And generosity reminds you of how blessed you are. When you give it away, it gives God a chance to continue blessing. And uh, it doesn't grow stagnant, but it keeps moving and flowing through the body. So I'm grateful for it today. Thank you for the words today, Seth. I appreciate it. Let's close in prayer tonight, shall we? Lord, we love you, Jesus. We thank you, God, for your blessings in our lives. Lord, thank you for your word this evening, Jesus. Help us. Thank you for the reminder, God, uh, to be generous, to be a giver, and not just to be selfish, God. I thank you uh, for the inspiration, for your encouragement tonight, God, and remind us that we're loved, that we're children of the King, God, and you've given us so very much, God. We're blessed, we're grateful, we're thankful, God. Pray that you help each and every one of us to take this word with us, to apply it to our lives, God. Help us to be givers as much as possible, God. And uh, we know that you'll keep on blessing like you do. We love you. We be praised in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless your church. Hope you have an amazing, amazing week. Remember, we'll see you on Saturday for our men. And then, of course, bilingual service, Spanish and English on Sunday. We'll see you. God bless you. Love on somebody before you go.